uh, there he is the leader of the Black Disciples. And last September, it was Joe Swift who delivered the eulogy for Brother George Jackson at Mount Vernon, Illinois. We want to thank you. We've got a couple of announcements here. The SCAF organization is presenting Report from the South that will be Saturday night, June 10th at 8 p.m. The featured speaker will be Reverend Al Dorch of Operation Attorney Leo Branton. security reasons only, please, no more standing ovations, not even for Sister Angela, for security reasons. This place holds, holds many memories for me, this hall. I studied for the bar exams uh, in this building. I appeared here as a co-chairman of the campaign to save the life of the Rosenbergs. And I came here with my, who is now my wife, but my first date was with my wife in this building. We came to a Paul Robeson concert. So this place holds for me joy, tears, agony, and triumph. I'll let you put them in order. I assure you that neither the agony nor the tears belong to the fact that uh, I had my first date with my wife here. <laughs> in any event, this is a night of triumph. It is Angela's triumph. It is a triumph of the people. And for that reason, I'm not going to make a speech. However, some people have asked me if I would please say to you supporters of Angela some of the things that I said to the jury in the final argument uh, just before her acquittal. And I'm not going to repeat my jury speech, of course, but I think that you should be aware of the fact that one of the primary responsibilities that we on her defense team had before an all-white jury was to try to get them to think black. And in a part of my final argument to the jury, I asked them if they would, for a few minutes, be black and think black. And I reminded them that if they were black, they could certainly understand one element of the case which the prosecution believed was one of its strongest points. It was a strange thing. I talked to uh, so many of my friends here in Los Angeles, my, my white friends, and even those people who were sympathetic to Angela kept asking, but why did she flee? Why, 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 did, she, why, why did she take off? And I said to them, as I said to the jury, no black person in this world would ask why did she flee? They would only ask... They would only ask, why did she allow herself to be caught? So that when I asked that jury to be black and to think black, 
I reminded them that if they were black, they would recall that over 300 years ago, their forebearers were brought to this country in the holds of ships in chains, and that only the strongest of them survived because the weak died in their own vomit and in their own stench and their own filth. And when this country had its declaration of independence and it declared that all men were created equal, it didn't mean black men, it meant all white men were created equal. Because in the beginning, a black man wasn't even counted as a whole man. He was counted as three-fifths of a man. And then they passed a fugitive slave law wherein slave masters could chase any slave across any state line and bring him back on the basis of a simple affidavit that there had been no, there would have to be no trial, no jury, no proof, just an affidavit saying this slave is mine. And even those people who signed the Declaration of Independence owned many hundreds of slaves. And black people realize that. But we didn't have to continue in the history of the past to remember the lot of black people in this country. We can come up through Birmingham, Alabama, where Angela Davis lived. And we can remember the racism which existed and which brought about a situation where three young black girls were dynamited and killed in a church because of the fact that people were trying to be treated with equal dignity. And in Angela Davis, any black person would remember those things. And in Angela Davis would remember that every time any black person who tried to speak out for the dignity of man reared his head, he was assassinated like a Medgar Evers or a Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X. And she remembered that when the Black Panthers in Los Angeles became somewhat of a threat to the status quo, that 350 police officers in Los Angeles, armed with automatic weapons and with bulletproof vests, synchronized their watches like an army operation and at 5 a.m. made simultaneous, brutal, unlawful, illegal, monstrous military attacks upon the homes and the and the headquarters of Black Panthers with an effort and an intent to kill everybody in there. And how in, had it not been for the fact that these brave people fought off the police for five hours until they were able to get the citizenry and the media there when they were surrendered, they would have all been dead, just as Fred Hampton was murdered in his bed in Chicago. And so, when Angela Davis knew that the power structure of this state was trying to connect her with a crime and with crimes with which she had no connection, all of these things must have flashed through her mind. And so having this kind of a background, coming from that kind of history and having those facts at her command, is there any doubt as to why she did take off and make herself, as we called, unavailable? <laughs> In any event, I am delighted that she made herself unavailable, unavailable because she came back to fight a better day. And the better day, as you and I know, after a long, hard struggle, resulted in victory not only for Angela, but for the cause which she espouses so well. I am delighted and happy to have been a part of that fight. Thank you. when we first came on, when we talked about how a mass struggle is put together to form a mass defense at the end of the did not rise above her people or her class, 
but only rise with them. With that, I'd like to introduce Angela Davis. become 
a figure known to great numbers of people. At that time, I was simply aspiring to do everything I could to give my meager talents and energy to the cause of my people, to the cause of black people, brown people, and to all racially oppressed and economically oppressed people in this country and throughout the globe. But history doesn't always conform to what are our own personal desires. It doesn't always conform to the blueprint we set up for our lives. My life and the lives of my family, my mother, my comrades, my friends, has really been drastically transformed over the last two years. But what happened was that as our movement, and particularly our movement right here in Los Angeles, our movement to free political prisoners, our movement to free all oppressed people, as that movement began to grow and become stronger and develop in breadth, it just so happened that I was the one who, one of the ones who was singled out by the government's finger of repression. It just so happened that I was destined to become yet another symbol of what the government intends to do, what the government in this state would do to every person who refuses to be its passive, submissive subject. society. 
I remember the women in the sterile cells of Marin County Jail and the women in the dimly lit windowless cells in Santa Clara County. There is still the savage inhumanity of Soledad Prison. One Soledad brother, our brother George, has been murdered. The two who survived were recently acquitted. But hundreds more are waiting our aid and solidarity. There are hundreds and thousands of Soledad brothers, of San Quentin brothers, of Folsom brothers, of CIW sisters, all of whom are prisoners of an insanely criminal social order. So let us celebrate, but let us celebrate in the only way that is compatible with all the pain and suffering that so many of our sisters and brothers must face each morning as they awake to the oppressive sight of impenetrable concrete and steel, as they awake to the harsh banging of heavy iron doors opening and closing at the push of a button, as they awake each morning to the inevitable jangling of the keeper's key, keys which are a constant reminder that freedom is so near, yet so far away, millenniums and millenniums away. So let us celebrate in the only way that is fitting. Let the joy of victory be the foundation of an undying vow, a renewed commitment to the cause of freedom. But we know now that victories are possible, though the struggles they demand are long so let our elation merge with the pledge to carry on this fight until a time when all the antiquated ugliness and brutality of jails and prisons linger on, linger on only as a mere night, a mere memory of a nightmare. For our vow will be fulfilled only when we or our children, or our grandchildren will have succeeded in seizing the reins of history, in determining the destiny of mankind, in creating a society where prisons are unheard of because the racism and the exploitative economic arrangement which reproduces want for the many and wealth for the few will have become relics of a past era. by looking towards its prisons. Look towards its dungeons, and there you will see in concentrated and microcosmic form the sickness of the entire system. And today, in the United States of America, in 1972, there is something that is particularly revealing about the analogy between the prison and the larger society of which, it, of which it is a reflection. For in a painfully real sense, we are all prisoners of a society whose bombastic proclamations of freedom and justice for all are nothing but meaningless rhetoric. For this society's accumulated wealth, its scientific achievements, but swallowed up by the avarice of a few capitalists and by insane projects of war and other irrational ventures. We are imprisoned in a society where there is so much wealth and so many sophisticated scientific and technological skills that anyone with just a little bit of common sense can see the insanity of the continued existence of ghettos and barrios and the poverty of the So when we see the rockets taking off towards the moon and the B-52s raining destruction and death on the people of Vietnam, we know that something is wrong. We know that all we have to do is to 
redirect that wealth and that energy and channel it into food for the hungry, into clothes for the needy, into schools, hospitals, housing, and all the material things that are necessary. comfortable lives, in order to lead lives, lives which are devoid of all the pressures of racism, and yet male supremacist attitudes and institutions, and all the other means with which the rulers manipulate the people. For only then can freedom take on a truly human meaning. Only then can we be free to live and to love and be created human beings. In this society, in the United States of America today, we are surrounded by the very wealth and the scientific achievements which hold forth a promise of freedom. Freedom is so near, yet at the same time it is so far away. And this thought evokes in me the same sensation I felt as I reflected on my own condition in a jail in New York City. So from my cell, I could look down from the crowded streets of Greenwich Village, almost tasting the freedom of movement and the freedom of space which had been taken from me and all my sisters in captivity. It was so near, but at the same time so far away, because somebody was holding the keys that would open the gates to freedom. Our condition here and now, the condition of all of us who are brown and black and working women and men, bears a very striking similarity to the condition of the prison. The wealth and the technology around us tells us that a free, humane, harmonious society lies very near. <coughs> but at the same time, it is so far away because someone is holding the keys and that someone refuses to open the gates to freedom. Like the prisoner, we are locked up with the ugliness of racism and poverty and war and all the attendant mental frustrations and manipulations. We're also locked up with our dreams and visions of freedom and with the knowledge that if we only had the keys, if we could only seize them from the keepers, from the standard oil, the General Motors, and all the giant corporations, <laughs> and of course, from the protectors the government, if we could only get our hands on those keys, we could transform these visions and these dreams Reality. Our situation bears a very excruciating similarity to the situation of the prisoner. And we must never forget this. For if we do, we will lose our desire for freedom and our will to struggle for liberation. As black people, as brown people, as people of color, as working men and women in general, we know and we experience the agony of the struggle for existence each day. We are locked into that struggle. The parallels between our lives and the lives of our sisters and brothers behind bars are very clear. Yet there is a terrifying difference in degree between life on this side of the bar and life on the other side. And just as we must learn from the similarities and acquire an awareness of all the forces which oppress us out here, it is equally important that we understand that the plight of the prisoner unfolds in the rock-bottom realms of human existence. Our sisters and brothers down there need our help and our solidarity and their collective strivings and struggles in the same elemental way that we all need fresh air and nourishment and shelter. <coughs> and when I say this, I mean it to be taken quite literally, because I recall too well 
that in the bleak silence and solitude of a Marin County isolation cell, you, the people, were my only hope, my only promise of life. Martin Luther King told us what he saw when he went to the mountaintop. He told us the visions of a new world of freedom and harmony. He told us of the sisterhood and brotherhood of humankind. Dr. King described it far more eloquently than I could ever attempt to do. But there's also the foot of the mountain. And there are also the regions beneath the surface. And I am returning from a descent together with thousands and thousands of our sisters and brothers into the <coughs> ugly depths of society. I want to try to tell you a little something about those reasons. I want to attempt to persuade you to join in the struggle to give life and breath to those who live fields away from everything that resembles human decency. Listen for a moment to George Jackson's description of life in Soledad Prison's Ovi. This place destroys the logical processes of the mind. A man's thoughts become completely disorganized. The north, he's fallen as far as he could get into the social track. Relief is so distant that it is very easy for him to lose his hope. It's worse than Vietnam. And the guards with the carbines and their sticks and tear gas are there to preserve this terror, to preserve it at any cost. This, in fact, is what they told us at the trial in San Jose. I'd like to read a passage from our cross-examination of one Sergeant Murphy, who was being questioned about San Quentin's policy of preventing escape. Question. And to be certain, I understand the significance of that policy, sir. Does that policy mean that if people are attempting to escape, and if they have hostages, and if the guards are able at all to prevent that escape, that they are to prevent that escape, even if it means that every hostage is killed. Answer, that is correct. Question, and that means whether they're holding one judge or five judges, or one woman or 20 women, or one, children, one child or 20 children, that the policy of San Quentin guards is that at all costs they must prevent the escape. Is that right? Answer. That also includes the officers that work in the institution, sir. Question, all right, even if they are holding other officers who work at the institution, that should not deter the San Quentin Correctional Officers from, from preventing an escape at all costs. Is that right? Answer, that is correct. Question, in other words, it is more important to prevent the escape than to save human life. Is that correct? Answer, yes, sir. You can find this in the official court records of the trial. This Sergeant Murphy told us that day why San Quentin guards were so eager to pump their bullets into the bodies of Jonathan Jackson, William Christmas, James McLean, and Michelle McGee, even if it mean that a judge, even if it meant that a judge, a DA, and women jurors might also be felled by their bullets. The terror of life in prison, its awesome presence in the society at large could not be disturbed. Murphy calls the prison by its rightful name. He captures the essence of the socio-political function of prisons today, where he was talking about a self-perpetuating system of terror. 
For prisons are political weapons. They function as means of containing elements in this society which threaten the stability of the larger system. In prison, people who are actually or potentially disruptive of the status quo are confined, contained, punished, and in some cases, forced to undergo psychological treatment by mind-altering uh, drugs. This is happening in the state of California. The prison system is a weapon of repression. The government views young black and brown people as actually and potentially the most rebellious elements of this society. And thus, the jails and prisons throughout this country are overflowing with young people of color. Anyone who has seen the streets of ghettos and barrios can, can already understand how easily a sister or a brother can fall victim to the police who are always there in mass. Depending on the area, this country's prison population contains from 45% to 85% people of color. Nationally, 60% of all women prisoners are black. And tens of thousands of prisoners in city and county jails have never been convicted of any crime. They are simply there, victims. They are there under the control of insensitive, incompetent, and often blatantly racist public defendants who insist that they plead guilty even though they know that their, their client is just as innocent as they are. And for those who have committed a crime, we have to seek out the root cause. And we seek this cause not in them as individuals, but in the capitalist system that produces the need for crime in the first place. and the spiritually hungry commit antisocial acts because their human needs cannot be met in a property-oriented state. It is a fair estimate, he goes on to say, that somewhere around 90% of the crimes committed would not be considered crimes or would not occur in a people-oriented society. In October 1970, a prisoner who had taken part in the Toombs Rebellion in New York gave the following answers to questions put to him by a newsman. Question, what is your name? Answer, I am a revolutionary. Question, what are you charged with? Answer, I was born black. <laughs> Question, how long have you been in? Answer, I've had trouble since the day I was born. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Once our sisters and brothers are entrapped inside these massive medieval fortresses and dungeons, whether for nothing at all, or whether for frame-up political charges, whether for trying to escape their misery, through a petty property crime, through narcotics or prostitution. They are caught in a vicious circle. For if on the other side of the walls they try to continue or to begin to be men and women, the brutality they face, the brutality they must face, increases with mounting speed. I remember very well the women in the House of Detention in New York who vowed to leave the heroin alone which was beginning to destroy their lives. Women who vowed to stand up and fight a system which had driven them to illusory escape through drugs. 
women who began to outwardly exhibit their new commitment and their new transformation. And these were the women whom the works of the matron sought out to punish them and to put them in the hole. George Jackson was murdered by mindless, carving, toting, sand pointing guards because he refused, he resisted, and he helped to teach his fellow prisoners that there was hope through struggle. And now in San Quentin, in San Quentin's adjustment center, which is a euphemistic term for the worst of the worst in prison, there are six more brothers who were facing charges of murder stemming from that day when George was killed. There is Fleeta Drungo, who as a Soledad brother, was recently acquitted from similar frame-up charges. There are Hugo Pinnell, Larry Spain, Luis Talamantes, David Johnson, and Willie Tate. As I was saved and freed by the people, so we must save and free these beautiful struggling brothers. We must also save and free Rochelle McGee. Robert Wells. He spent over 40 years of his life in California's prison system because he refused to submit because he was a man. We must say right here in Southern California, Gary Long. My freedom was achieved as the outcome of a massive, a massive people struggle. Young people and older people, black, brown, Asian, Native American and white people, students and workers. The people seized the key which opened the gates to freedom. And we've just begun. The momentum of this movement must be sustained, and it must be increased. Let us try to seize more keys and open more gates and bring out more sisters and brothers so that they can join the ranks of our struggle out here. In building a prison movement, we must not forget our brothers who were suffering in military prisons, in the stockades on bases throughout the country and across the globe. Let us not forget Billy Dean Smith. <laughs> Billy Dean Smith, one of our black brothers who is now awaiting court martial in Fort Orr, California. In Vietnam, this courageous brother from this city, from Washington, would not follow orders. For he refused, he refused to murder the Vietnamese whom he knew as his comrades in the struggle for liberation. He would not follow orders. to the other GI. He had to be eliminated. So he was falsely accused with killing two white officers in Vietnam. In his game for Vietnam. We must free Billy Dean Smith. We must free Billy Dean Smith and all his brothers and comrades who were imprisoned in the military.
like the solar dead brothers, the San Quentin Six, Billy Dean Smith, but one which will begin to attack the very foundations of the prison system itself. <laughs> and in doing this, the prison movement must be integrated into our struggles for black and brown liberation and to our struggles for an end to material want and need. A very long struggle awaits us. And we know that it would be very romantic and idealistic to entertain immediate goals of tearing down all the walls of all the jails and prisons throughout this country. We should take on the task of freeing as many of our sisters and brothers as, as possible. And at the same time, we must demand the ultimate abolition of the prison system along with the revolutionary transformation of this society. <laughs> however, however, within the context of fighting for fundamental changes, there is something else we must do. We must try to alter the very fabric of life behind walls as much as is possible through struggle. And there are a thousand concrete issues around which we can build this movement. <laughs> Uncensored and unlimited male privileges, visits of the prisoners to minimum wage levels in prison, adequate medical care. And for women, this is particularly important when you consider that in some prisons, a woman, a pregnant woman, has to fight just to get one glass of milk per day. I saw this in New York. There are other issues. Literature must be uncensored. Prisoners must have the right to school themselves as they see fit. If they wish to learn about Marxism, Leninism, and about socialist revolution, then they should have the right to do it.
But Attica was different from these other episodes in one very important respect. For this time, the authorities were indicted by the very events themselves. They were caught red-handed in their lives. They were publicly exposed when to justify that massacre, a massacre which was led by Governor Rockefeller and agreed to by President Nixon. When they hastened to fall Perhaps this in itself has pulled greater numbers of people from their socially inflicted slumber. Many have already expressed outrage, but outrage is not enough. Governments and prison bureaucracies must be subjected to fierce and unqualified criticism for their harsh and murderous repression. But even this is not enough. So this is not yet the root of the matter. People must take a forthright stand in active support of prisoners and their grievances. They must try to comprehend the eminently human content of prisoners' stirring and struggle. For it is justice that we see. And many of us can already envision a world unblemished by poverty and alienation, one where the prison will be but a vague memory, a relic to the past. But we also have immediate demands for justice right now, for fairness, and for room to think and live and act. Thank you.